How's everybody today? Good. It's so good to see you here this morning. It's always a good day to be in the house of the Lord, and we're so glad that you're here. We're going to start today a little bit different. Uh, Pastor Don and Angie, if you'd come up front here, we would appreciate it. Um, October, of course, of course, we're a day late, but October is Pastor Appreciation Month. And hopefully we can tell them that we appreciate them every month of the year, every day of the year. But today I just would like to read a scripture over them. So if you would stand with me, we'll pray that over them and ask a blessing for our pastor and his wife. So, And the verse today is from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. I've been listening to a song about this lately and it's just really touched my heart and I see it. It's very appropriate for you guys today. It says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so now maybe let's just pray a prayer of peace and love and all that God wants for our pastor this morning, okay? Lord, thank you so much for sending our pastor and his wife here just to help shepherd our church. We're grateful for the love that you put in their hearts for your people and most of all, for their love for you. And I pray that you just bless their ministry, bless everything that they do, bless their homes, and touch their hearts that they would feel your peace and your sense around them all the time. Thank you for them, and we're grateful for them. And Lord, most of all, we want to know that you're praised and worshiped through everything that we do here today and through our pastor and his wife. Thank you for them, bless them, and watch over them. Thank you for their love for us and for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Round of applause for Woo! Pastor and Angie. We appreciate you guys. We love you. Don't go away. <laughs> Focus on this church, though. Thank you so much. Love you. <laughs> All right, you guys. We're going to begin worship. Um, the song that we are going to start with today came to me kind of randomly. It's a song that I grew up singing in church, and I, I wanted to do a little bit of research about the song, and I found some things that I wanted to share with you. So this song was written by a woman named Lori Klein um, in the 70s. Uh, she was a new mom with a new baby. Her husband was a full-time college student, and they lived together in a small camper. Um, they did not have a home church at the time. They didn't have any nearby friends, and Lori didn't drive, so she wasn't able to get out and visit with people and make friends and find a church or anything like that. Um, she described this time in her life as very hopeless, um, a very depressed time, she said. During her morning study, she said that she was so empty. She said, end quote, I knew I didn't have anything to offer him, God. I asked him if he would like to hear me sing. If he would just give me something that he would be in the mood to hear. And I think that's so beautiful. Um, she came to God that morning totally empty, hopeless, depressed even. Um, nothing to offer God. But she said, God, give, give me something. What can I give to you is what she said, right? She said, with no effort, the words just came from her mouth. And she sang, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice. You guys know how it goes. Yes. She said that the, she was surprised by the words that came from her mouth, and she was moved by them herself. And she said the next part of the song came out just as easily as the first part did. You guys want to continue? <laughs> Take joy, my king, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. In Psalm 100, it says, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and delight. 
come before his presence with joyful singing. And I believe that's what Lori did that morning. She came to God empty, but her soul rejoiced as she sang to him. And there's another scripture that I found as I was doing my research. Um, in 2 Corinthians, it says, My grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. So although Lori was completely empty, hopeless, depressed, she came to God willing. She came to God available. And she rejoiced to him even in her pain and suffering. The easy part is rejoicing and worshiping and praying in our victories, right? In our happiness. It is much harder to rejoice and to praise in our pain, is it not? Yet that's what God asks us to do. To come to him even empty. So if you came today and you're empty, maybe you feel hopeless, maybe you feel depressed, maybe you feel like you just don't have anything to offer God today. Maybe you're not even sure why you're sitting out there today. Because what do I have to give God? We don't have to have anything to give him. We just have to give him our praise, offer ourselves in pain and victory. Can we do that this morning? That's what I'm prepared to do. Are you prepared for that today? Hello? Amen. <laughs> Let's stand and we're going to sing that song again together. Seems like most of you know it. Sing it to God today. Focus on the words that you're saying, right? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I live. voices that we have to offer you today and we know God that our voices are enough we love you God thank you Oh 
what he's done and who he is, correct? Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you None like you Our God is greater Our God is stronger God, you are higher than any other our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God.
We thank you, God, for the hope that you bring to a hopeless world. And for the light that you bring to a very dark world. Help us, God, to look to you in our troubles, not to run. Help us to remember you in our pain more than in our victories. God, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. And we know that we don't deserve any of it. And the fact that you give it anyway is amazing. God, we, we are so grateful for this time that we get to connect with you. And we thank you for being here with us, for hanging out with us. And God, we just invite you to, to remain here, to remain here with us. Throughout the rest of this service, God, we, we invite you to, to speak to us. We're turning on our ears so that we can hear. And God, I pray that you would speak through pastor. Thank you, God, for putting your words in his mouth. Thank you for blessing him with the the personality that he has to be able to come up here and to speak to us, God, and the bravery and God that just the, the hope that he brings to us. We're so thankful for our pastor. And I just want to pray specifically for pastor. We, we've done that, but we need to do it more anyway. I want to pray that you would every day when he sits in that office diligently every day that you would fill that room. I just have this image. Pastor will close the doors and he'll turn on his heater because it gets cold in here and, and it's, you know, it costs money to heat the whole church. Um, so he'll sit in the office, turn on the little heater and close those doors so the heat just stays in that room. And I just have this image of not just the heat filling that room, but like the presence of God filling that room. That heat gets so thick in there sometimes. I pray that, God, your presence would be thick in that room. And, God, that he would hear from you every day so that he can bring those words and bring that hope that you give him, bring it to us. Because, God, we need that. And we need our pastor. We need you to anoint him daily. We thank you for his willingness to be here every day, to pour into us, God. I pray that you would pour into him more than he's been poured into in a long time, that he wouldn't even know what to do with all the pouring. And then, God, I pray that he would bring that pouring back to us and that it would overflow in this church because we need revival here. Revive pastor and revive the church, God. Thank you, God. We love you so much. And pastor, we love you so much. Pastor, do you want to come up and we can all just, maybe we shouldn't do direct laying of hands, but we can reach, we can reach toward and if there are any specific prayers that anybody would like to pray over Pastor, I welcome you to come up and, and pray those over him. God, thank you so much.
Angie, can you come up here as well, please? Because you guys are a team, and he needs your support just like you need his. God, we thank you for Angie. We thank you for the support that she gives to Pastor Daily, God, and we thank you for the lifting up the, that you would just fill her with that um, that hope and encouragement that I know sometimes as a pastor things get real heavy. Um, I pray that you would just make Angie um, that, that support system that pastor needs in his home, their home, not just his home. I pray, God, that you would just put your hands on Angie, God, and that, that you would help her to, to also be able to minister to us, God, because we, we need Angie's voice as well, and we need Angie's, we need Angie's, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody help me out. Investment. Yes, yes. <laughs> We, we need that from Angie as well. God, we thank you for, for the willingness that she has within her to come here, God, to spend time with us, to, to talk with us when we're having struggles. God, Angie is such a people person, and we're so grateful for that that you have put within her, that she knows how to communicate with people, God. And I am thankful for Angie's friendship. And I'm thankful for the words of encouragement that she has spoken to me over the years, for the hope that she has brought me. And I know sometimes things get heavy for Angie too. I pray that you would lift some of that burden off of her, God. That you would provide relief to her, God, when she needs that. That you would help renew her spirit daily. It's a heavy burden pastor and pastor's wives carry. And again, we thank you for their willingness to do that.
Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for that. I don't even know how to end this, you guys. This is good. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Angie. We love you guys very much, and we appreciate you. And I suppose that is when Pastor, this is your cue. (laughs) (laughs) Amen. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we really appreciate that. Did I turn that on? Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, a couple of real quick things just before we, we get into the Word this morning. Um, Tuesday's kind of a big day, and uh, uh, I encourage you to go out and vote. You, you have to make your own decisions in terms of, of what you what you feel is the right thing to do in that regard, but uh, it's an opportunity that we have to influence the way our country goes through the vote, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, Also, starting tomorrow, apparently we are in a new, more restricted COVID time. Um, I haven't actually read what all the restrictions are, so look it up. (laughs) Nothing significant. I mean, basically, it's, it's more of the same. Just be careful. I mean, it, it's a real issue. It's something we have to be careful about. But don't get, you know, you, you, your adults make decisions uh, in terms of how to protect yourself um, in that regard. Also, the, the offering bowls are on the back table there. Uh, instead of passing the offering plate, we've just been putting them back there for a while now to uh, make it as touch-free as possible. Uh, We're going to be back in Genesis 3 today, but I want to begin by telling you a little story. It's a story of two brothers and a friend, uh, one winter, who were out behind the neighbor's house, and uh, their yard was fenced in, so they were, you know, all the way beyond the, the backyard, and There was snow on the ground, and it may be that the two brothers who lived next to this woman um, didn't like her very much. Now, I don't know about you, but, you know, sometimes growing up, the the neighbor lady is is not what you as a teenager thinks she should be. Uh, Sometimes they're mean, whatever that means to a teenage boy. And these, uh, these three friends were out back at the edge of the property, and two of them began to make snowballs and began to throw them at the neighbor's house. The brother spent the whole time warning the other two that the trouble that they were going to get in for throwing snowballs at the neighbor's house, but the two were older than the younger brother. And so they decided that it was actually safe. And uh, there was apparent, there was, there was just a satisfying, something satisfying about thump when the snowballs hit the roof of that house. Thump. Thump. You just imagine the woman inside getting all annoyed, you know, maybe frustrated. Maybe not sure what in the world was going on. Thump. Thump. Crash. The unexpected happened. Now you, you know, mostly we're adults here. Probably most of us can process this out that if you throw snowballs at a house, enough snowballs at a house, you may just end up breaking a window. But apparently teenage boys don't have brains that function completely and hadn't thought that out. They were scared. And so they ran across their own backyard around the neighbor next to them who didn't have a fence, came into the front yard to the driveway and into the house. 
Shortly after that, there was a knock on the door. It was one of our fine officers of the law who had come to question these young men about the uh, incident that just occurred. And uh, having been taught well, growing up in a Christian home, didn't feel like he could lie. So when the officer said, were you throwing snowballs at the neighbor's house? He admitted what he had done. Today we're going to talk about the fact that sin has consequences. These unnamed young men, the two older ones, the friends, they became responsible to pay for that window. The younger brother um, was uh, identified as not having been a part of the activity. He was there war actually warning us, <clears throat> I mean them, about not throwing snowballs at the house. And, you know, it's hard for an older brother to admit as a teenager that the younger brother was correct. But we live in a world where sin abounds. And as we continue down the, the path to wherever it is that this nation is heading, um, it seems to be that there is a, an acceleration of sin and the idea that, well, sin isn't sin and it's no big deal and it has no consequence. Well, this morning we're going we're gonna to look at the consequences of sin that we find the first man and the woman in the garden. Now, the last several weeks we've talked about how in chapter 1, God determined that he wanted to create mankind in his own image. And so he created them. It says male and female, he created them. So men and women both fully are representative image bearers of God. In chapter 2, he got a little bit more, a little more detail there about the creation of the male and the female, whether the male was taken and made from the dirt and God breathed into him the breath of life, put him in the garden, gave him, you know, a, a, told him to take care of the garden, and then... He said to himself, it's not good for him to be alone. It's the first, thing, first time he said something wasn't good in the creation sequence. And so he brings the animals and he says, here, go ahead and name the animals. And they, he brought the animals all in front of him and he would name the animals as they went past. But he couldn't find someone to be his connection, his helper, his, his partner. And so God put him to sleep, extricated his rib, or more likely it's referring to the side, but he took part of Adam and created the woman and then brought her to him. He saw her and he's like, what? Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. You are just like me. You shall be called woman because you are taken from man. And, and we saw that that the, the Hebrew words there is, it's ish and isha. It was simply, he added the feminine ending to the name, the, the general term for mankind. He recognized, she's the same as me, but she's different, <laughs> right? But he was recognition of the, the interconnectedness that we are of one creation together. And then we left him there in the garden, naked and unashamed, un, un, encumbered by all of the things, all of the guilts and all of the, the, the things that, that cause us to stress out and, and be in conflict with each other. Then the dark cloud comes, right? Metaphorically. We, we see the, the snake come on the scene. The snake is craftier than the other animals. He's identified as, as, as kind of being, you know, standing a, a above the other animals. There's something special about him. He's, he's craftier then, and he has this whole interaction with the woman, convinces her that it, it would be good for you to eat from the fruit of the tree that God has said not to, and so she does. She gives to her the man. He eats as well. Immediately they realize they're naked. 
But now they are ashamed. Now there's, there's, there, there's this feeling of vulnerability, and so they, they, they try to cover themselves up with palm leaves and, uh, and hide. That evening, God comes to the, the garden like he always does, and he says, Adam, where are you? He says, well, we're, we're, we're hiding over here. We're hiding we're, because we, we're, we're naked. And we're ashamed. Notice he didn't say, we ate of the tree and we're feeling guilty because we know that you said not to do that. They were hiding. He said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree? Well, it's not my fault. It's that woman that you gave me. It's a woman's fault. It's your fault. He said to the woman, what did you do? She said, well, the serpent tricked me and I ate. Then he turns to the serpent. And notice he doesn't address the serpent and try to get the story from the serpent. And that's where we, we pick up this morning our, our text in chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since it was from, since it, you, from it you were taken. Oh, sorry there. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So, God now addresses the different players in this drama, if you will, okay? Now, I want you to notice, and and as the the story is written, there's there's this wonderful flow to it where God takes and he creates the animals, he creates the man, he creates the woman. The man... The, the <laughs> sorry, had a brain brain moment there, but he he addresses them in the order of the transgression. Okay, so he begins with the snake, he goes to the woman, and then he he finishes up with the end. Okay, but what I want you to notice here is that there are two curses in this passage of scripture. You know, sometimes we think of this as the the place where you know God cursed the man and the woman and the snake. That's not what happens. Notice, the curses are on the snake and on the ground. He does not curse the man or the woman. God does not curse us. And and notice as well, if you look at the the snake and the man, okay, the, the, the cursing that happens to them, there's actually a formula that they use. It says, because you did something... Because the snake tricked the woman, because the man took and ate the fruit, you, there, there's a curse that is pronounced. The curse is then identified. In the snake's case, it's on you. In the man's case, it's on the ground. There's a consequence to that curse. And interestingly enough, both of those consequences are related to eating. The snake's going to eat dirt. The man is going to eat by the sweat of his brow. And of course, how'd they get into this mess? Eating the wrong thing, right? In both of those cases, it says, these, this curse will be on you all the days of your life. And then there's something that we don't, we don't find in the English text just because it's the English text, okay? There are, at the end of both of those sections, repeated words 
that are very, very similar, okay? Hebrew loves wordplay. The, the authors of the Old Testament, they loved wordplay, and there's, there's a lot of that going on throughout the course of especially the Old Testament. But the word that is translated for bruise or strike, okay? You know, the passage where it says that the, the snake is going to strike the heel and the, the seed is going to crush the head. That's actually the same word. Now, when it's translated that way, it doesn't come across that way, does it? It sounds like it's two separate things. But it's the same word. And the Hebrew word, and my pronunciation may or may not be accurate, is shuf. At the end of the, the curse on the land, in the, the, when he's talking to the man, he repeats the word return. You will return to the dust. That word is shuv. And so you, you, hear the, you hear how they're similar, okay? And that's very common in, in Hebrew wordplay. But they didn't die on the spot. I wonder if they expected to. You know, we, we don't really know what they were thinking, of course, but you wonder, did, did they, what did they expect when they ate from that fruit? But they did not die on the spot. But now they live with the consequences of a world that is infested with sin and death. One author put it that they're now living in their death bodies. They're not going to die today, but they will die. There will come a time when they will be dead. And because of this, there is a, a disconnection between the beautiful relationship that they had with God in the garden. And in all their cases, conflict is at the center of it. There's going to be conflict in all areas of your life because of what happened. So, first he confronts the serpent. The serpent is cursed by God because it rebelled. Now, interestingly enough, the word crafty and cursed are, again, one of these word plays. The serpent was recognized as being greater than, better than, something different than the other creatures of the field. It's identified as one of those creatures but he's craftier than them. He, he's head and shoulders above the rest, and now he is cursed, and he will be a belly crawler. All the days of his life, he will crawl on his belly. That probably doesn't mean that he used to have feet, but it is a, it, an expression of humil humiliation that you will be humiliated. You will be in a docile form. You know, if a snake is ready to strike, it's coiled up, it's sitting up. You know, in my mind, I think of the king cobra, right? He's sitting up, he's got the big flaps out, he's ready to attack, okay? That's an attack position or even a defense position. But the snake that is down on the ground is in a docile position, is not able to attack. And he's saying, you're, basically, you will be humiliated all the days of your life because of what you have done here. And I will put enmity, I'll put fight a fight between you and the woman there is going to be a battle that will rage for all time both between you and her but then between your seed and her seed so who are these seeds i don't think that this has anything to do with women not liking snakes okay my wife has a snake well i technically we have a snake in the bedroom she got it so that she could take it to school, and then her principal said that she couldn't take it to school. <laughs> okay? This, this has to do with this ongoing battle that those who are followers of God, those who are obedient to what He says, are going to have with those who are rebellious against the God of creation. So who are these seeds? Well, I would suggest to you, at one level... The whole book of Genesis is written to answer that question. Verse or chapter 4, what's the story? Cain and Abel. What do we have? We have one who is obedient to God and one who is disobedient to God and kills the one who is obedient to God. There's conflict. All throughout Genesis, you see through Noah, through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, all the way to the, the very end of Genesis, you have this, this telling of the story of the creation of God's people. And they are the seeds of the woman who are in combat with those who are disobedient. 
We also uh, recognize as we look back through the, Old Te- or through the New Testament, this, uh, this particular verse is, is called the Proto-Evangelium or something along those lines. Basically, it is the pre-gospel. It is the first place we see in Scripture that points to the fact that there is coming a seed, singular, because seed can be singular or plural. There is a seed that is coming who will do combat with the the power behind the snake, which is not identified in in Genesis, but I think it's, it's clear to see that it's obviously Satan is the one who is behind this, this attack on humanity. And so they will, they will be at war with one another. And so the history of humanity is us trying to stomp that snake and the snake trying to bite our heel. And in the end, God will destroy the snake. But there is this battle back and forth where we're trying to st- strike him, he's trying to strike us. Verse 16, then, he confronts the woman. And he begins by saying, multiplying, I will multiply. In other words, I will greatly multiply. And then he says two things. I will greatly multiply your pain or toil and your conception. What does that mean? First of all, we know that when you say multiply, multiply, when, when we have that form where you have the, a word repeated in those forms, we know that it's an intensification, right? We saw that. Dying you will die was translated you will surely die, okay? So there's this intensification that, that, multi, that there will be this intensification of multiplication. What is multiply? Now, <clears throat> there are two different ways that we can look at this. Most modern translations take that as what is known as a hendiasis or hendiatis or I don't know, something like that, okay? But basically what it is is you have two words that are kind of scrunched together for, to make one concept. And so that's why it's translated painful um, labor or something like that, okay? Because the, the word for conception is, is, is kind of seen as perhaps covering the whole of the pregnancy time period and then that's an intensification of that. Uh, some of, there, there are some translations, uh, in, including the, uh, the old King James. And I tend to, to like other translations better than the King James. But in this case, I think the King James may have actually got it right. And that is that they are two separate concepts. What is he multiplying? He is going to multiply this, this labor. And he's going to multiply her conception. Now, the word conception is used twice outside of this passage. Um, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me back step, sorry. Okay, first, the, 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 that, that phrase, multiplying I will multiply, this is used three times. And it's interesting how many times is three times words, but it's, that's neither here nor there. Okay. Three times it's used, multiplying I will multiply. In this situation, okay, in Genesis 16, 10, when Hagar is out in the desert ready to just give up because she's been abused by Sarah, has been abusing her, and she's just gone out to, Lord, just take me. And God speaks to her and says, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants. The other time is Genesis twenty two seventeen. Abraham and Isaac are in a very important moment in their life where Abraham has raised the knife and God stopped him from killing his son. And after that, God says to him, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Multiplying, I will multiply your descendants to where they're as numerous as the stars in the skies. So the way it's used in the other places in Scripture, it, it is in this context of multiplying your descendants. So what, about, so what is this? If, if, in fact, this is not a hendiasis, if, if, and I, this is what I think, 
If, in fact, these two words are intended to be taken separately, what are they, okay? Toil. What is the toil? Well, the toil perhaps is related to the pregnancy, right? The the next line is going to talk about how you will have pain, toil, struggle in your pregnancies, okay? So it could be related to that, but it's the exact same word that is used in verse 17 when it says, you will have painful toil when you try to get food out of the ground. And one of the authors I was reading made a suggestion that just seemed to really make sense to me. That this is perhaps a, 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 a pivotal verse where the toil is actually looking forward a verse to the next verse. It, right now, all she hears is toil, but she doesn't really know what that means. But then in the next verse, when the, when the, the man is told what the toil is, now it, she has a greater understanding of what that could be. And then the verse conception actually ties back to the snake. Because what is he told? Your seed and my seed will be in conflict. So it's not the same word, but it's the same concept, right? So, the word toil, again, used three times. Here, it's also used in chapter 4, verse 7. When Cain and Abel, they've, they've taken their, their offering to God. Cain didn't like it because Abel's was accepted and his wasn't. And he was processing that. And God says to him that Satan desires you and he's wanting to, to, to destroy you. I've jumped ahead of myself again. This has been, this is pretty complicated, and, and it's taken me two weeks of, of really hashing to this to try to, to, to try to get a really good grip on what this is, and, and I don't know if I have a really good grip, but this is what I've got, okay? The only other, toil, let's go back to toil, I'm sorry. Toil, the only other place that toil is mentioned is when Noah is, is born. It says, he's na- he named him Noah. And said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. So when Noah is born, his father names him that because he's going to be a comfort to us in the midst of the pain and toil. And he points right back to this passage. So the toil that he's talking about in this and in the the conflict with the man is about the toil of creating the food that we need to survive. So, very possibly, that could be the toil that he's talking about here. So, what about the conception? Again, used three times. It's just weird how that happens sometimes, I guess. And, and this, the, the, this word here that's, that's translated conception, it's, it's, it's kind of a shortened version of a longer word. And so, that, you know, there's all kinds of ideas, as you might imagine. There's, you know, a thousand commentaries out there. There's 2,000 different ideas, but... Three times it's used for conception, right? This, this place here, uh, second place is in Ruth 4.13. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. So the word is used there specifically for conception, which is the opposite part of the pregnancy cycle from delivery, right? Second time, is used in a, in a metaphorical way about Ephraim, the nation of Ephraim. And that's in Hosea 9, verses 11. He says, Ephraim's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Again, the way it's worded, it, it has to mean the conception versus um, the birth. So if that's the case, what does that tell us? What does that tell us is that God, in the midst of, of, of telling the woman, this is what you're going to have to endure, puts a piece of hope in there. Yes, you're living in your death body. Yes, you and your husband will die. But I'm going to do what I told you I was going to do. 
you will give birth. You will conceive. You will, your, the, your lives will continue on, as it were, through the children that you will birth. Because remember, that's the first thing he told the couple in Genesis 1. What is one of their primary things? Be fruitful and multiply. And he's saying to her here that, that I will multiply not only the toil that you go through, but also I will multiply your conception. And then we have the, probably the, the trickiest thing, the, the one that's the most controversial, where it says that you will desire, your desire will be to your husband, or actually it begins, to the man will be your desire, and he will rule over you. And what does that mean? Well, remember, when God created the, the man and the woman in the garden, he created them to be partners, to work together to accomplish what God had called them to do. And now that's being broken because relationship is broken on all of these levels, right? There's conflict in all of these levels. The snake is going to fight with the, wife, the, the woman and the woman's children. Guess what? That includes both the men and the women. The woman is going to be in conflict with the snake, but now is also going to be in conflict with the husband. The husband is going to be in conflict with the snake, the woman, and now the ground. So the sin brings conflict into their lives. This united partnership, this, this, this two becoming one has been torn down. So is desire positive or negative? Guess how many times this word is you find in the Old Testament? Three times. <laughs> this one, you find it in the passage between Cain and Abel where sin is crouching at his door and you have to master it. Now, in that case, the desire is very negative. It's sin wanting you to take control of the situation, and, and you, but you have, to, you have to fight that. The other time that we find that is in Song of Solomon 7.10. And verses 1 to 9 is the husband or the, the, the man in that who's getting all PG on us. I mean, he's talking about his, his beloved, and he's not sparing details. I mean, he, is, he really likes the way she looks. You have to look it up sometime. But, you know, the Song of Solomon, that's what Song of Solomon is all about, right? It's this, this love poem between the man and the woman and, 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 and how much they care for each other and love each other. And it says there in verse 10, I belong to my beloved, his desire is for me. There's no negative tinge to that desire at all. Is her desire positive? You know, she, she, you're going to desire him, you're going to want to be with him, or is it negative? You're going you're to want to take charge and rule over him. <laughs> different commentators say different things. But the point is that you, she, you know, even if the desire is this negative, you're, you're going to rule over him. That's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to be partners together. The woman's not supposed to be over the man, but there's nowhere in the passage here that says the man's over the woman either. They're partners together. So he says the man will rule over you. He's, he's describing what will happen. There's no sense of command, and you, you can't actually take the, the grammar there and make it into a command. <laughs> There's no commanding that, that this is the way it's going to be because I want it to be this way. He's just telling the woman this is how it's going to be. There's going to be this conflict. And guess what? Men have testosterone. We tend to be bigger and stronger. And therefore, throughout most of history, that's all it took for men to be in charge. But notice it's not a curse. He's not saying to the woman, you're cursed to live this way because of what you did. Lastly, he, he, the man is confronted. He says, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree that I told you not to, remember that's how it starts, because you did this thing, then cursed is the ground. 
Now, I don't think the lesson we should learn from this is not to listen to your wife. (laughs) I would be in so much trouble in my life if I had not learned to listen to my wife. We need each other. I need Angie's perspectives on things, even though sometimes they're just different. Sometimes she understands things different than I do. And sometimes I need that. Well, most of the time I need that. The uh, other thing that we probably should not take away from this is that we shouldn't eat what our wife serves us. (laughs) Otherwise, I'd have gone hungry most of my life. It's not that he listened to his wife. It's not even that he took the fruit from the wife. Now, the wife is responsible for her own action. You get that? She ate of that fruit. Even though she was deceived, she was responsible for her own action. But the man taking the fruit from her wasn't the problem. The problem was he ate the fruit. And that's what God said not to do. The problem wasn't what his wife did. The problem was he was rebelling against what God had told him to do. He was being disobedient. And because of that, he said, the ground is now cursed. You will toil to get food. That same word, that, that, that word for toil and, and struggle and, and hardship and pain. You will toil for that. Not only that, instead of this beautiful garden where stuff grows, now remember they're taking care of the garden, right? So there's agri- they're actually doing things to help make things grow. But now, instead of this perfect place where there are no weeds, would you like one of those places, Mike? Huh? Now we live and there's junk stuff going to grow up. Thorns and thistles and stuff that you can't use and you can't eat and it's just worthless stuff. It's just in the way. Now you're going to have to work harder. You're going to have to sweat until you die. All the days of your life, until you go back to the dust, you're going to have to battle this ground. Now, in all of these cases, notice I think that we, we, we recognize these, these negative circumstances that come from the fall. In all of those things, I think we do what we can to moderate those as much as we can, right? I mean, let's face it. Mike, I hope you don't mind me saying, but Mike may not sweat too much when he's harvesting in that air-conditioned combine. I mean, I'm not saying that farming isn't hard work. I mean, he's got plenty of hard work that he does. But we take advantage of the tools, right? You know, hopefully nobody here thinks like, like in the past, many have thought in, in years gone by, hopefully many, nobody thinks that a woman who is somehow takes some sort of drug to help in the midst of a really tough labor, that that's a bad thing. When Stephen was born, Angie was in hard labor for like 20 hours before the doctor decided that it was time for him to deliver. I mean, it was so bad that my mother-in-law, man, she wanted to sue everybody. She was going to sue the hospital, and she was going to sue the doctors, and she was going to sue the nurses, and she was going to sue the guy walking down the street by the hospital. I mean, because she was in a lot of pain. And they gave her they gave her the good stuff, and she was still in a lot of pain. Now, my daughter, on the other hand, when she gave birth to that beautiful little grandbaby of mine, her hard labor was maybe an hour. I mean, she, you know, again, you know, anybody that's been pregnant, at least so I've heard, I've never actually been pregnant. <laughs> you know, th- there's, there's pain and there's all kinds of weird stuff that happens to emotions and hormones and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's not necessarily a, a, an easy process. But we would say to those women, yeah, do what you can to minimize the pain, right? So until you die, you're going to have to fight the ground. And then he goes on. In verse 20, he says, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments for skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said to him, 
The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed the east side of the Garden of Eden, cherubim and a flaming sword, flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So, things are different now. That's, that's, that's really the end of the story is things are different now. It's interesting, the first thing he does is Adam names Eve. Now, he wasn't told by God to do that. Why he did it, we, we don't necessarily know. We do know that uh, he named her Eve because he wanted to express that she was going to be the mother of the living. So I think at some level there's, there's some faith operating here where he's saying this woman is now going to be the mother of all creation. God is going to be faithful to what he said he was going to do in, in multiplying her, her, her pregnancies, in multiplying, you know, he's going to help us to be fruitful and multiply. Was Adam attempting to rule over Eve by naming her? That's what some people say. I think that that's possibly, this is the first illustration of man trying to take authority over woman. I'm the boss. We don't really know for sure. But we do know God didn't tell him to do it. And again, there's this conflict that occurs within the relationship. And God takes and clothes them. He provides skins for them. Uh, many people have seen in that a, a kind of a pre-shadowing of the, the need for blood to cover sin. I don't know that that is, I don't know that this thought out that deeply here. Looking back through the Scriptures, we can kind of see that, but the main thing to understand here is God, in the midst of punishing or disciplining them, is giving them grace and is providing for them. He's giving them the covers that they need, not the cheap covers that they fashioned for themselves that they hoped would be okay. He gave them cover for them. And notice he did it before he sent them out of the garden. He, he's concerned for us. He created us to love us, to be in relationship with us. God knows that when they leave the garden, everything's going to be different. The relationship with God's going to be different. The, the, the relationship with each other's going to be different. But he still wants them to recognize his love and his grace and provision. And so God kicks them out of the garden, sends them back to the dirt where he was created from, where he's now going to have to and I just, I kind of wonder if maybe the garden still is without weeds. The garden, you know, what we call the Garden of Eden, you know, we don't know where it is. We don't even know if there's a spot on earth that God's got hidden or whatever. But now he has to go back out into the rest of the, you know, to the, to the place outside the garden. And he's going to have to work at it. He's going to have to struggle to make ends meet. But he has to be cut off from the tree of life. And, and I... I we don't have time really to, to dig into that too much anyway, but, but honestly, I'm not exactly sure how that all plays into it. You know, was it, it, was it he was afraid they were going to eat or was he afraid that they weren't going to eat? Or, you know, the, the point is that God wants them out there living the life that they now have to live, and he's going to bring salvation to them. He's going to provide for them. But they can no longer do it in the, in the confines of, of the garden. Now they're going to have to go out and work. And one of these days, we will be reunited in the new heaven and the new earth. We will come back into a, a, some kind of a garden setting. It, it's, talk, it, it's described as a garden. It's described as a mountain. It, we're going to come back into that place where we have unfiltered, un, uninhibited worship with God and connection with God. And in that place, we will have un filtered, uninhibited connection with each other as well as those things are restored. So ultimately, and I know that we've gone along this morning for what we've been doing with the whole COVID thing, but there's just a lot here. But the question for you this morning is, 
are you struggling with sin in your life? Because sin has consequences. Whether you accept who Jesus is or not, sin has consequences. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are not shielded from the consequences of our sin. When we sin, we still pay a price. And so it's so important that we keep our heart open to the Holy Spirit to show us, Lord, help me to be your child, be obedient to you in all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Lord, I just ask that you help us. Lord, help us to just sit in your presence. It's hard to be obedient, Lord God, when we don't hear your voice. And it's hard to hear your voice when we don't stop and listen. Lord, I pray for anyone that's here this morning that may be struggling with issues in their lives, especially if they know that these are issues that are disobedient. But the fruit looks so good. It's it's beautiful. It it looks good to taste. It, it, It can help make me wise. Help us, Lord God, to recognize that we don't have the whole story and we need to hear your voice. Lord, if there are those here this morning struggling with with issues like that in their lives, Lord God, I pray that as they just let you know, as they they confess that to you, Lord God, just be faithful and just like you promised to be, to forgive them of their sin and to cleanse them from unrighteousness. Help each one of us, Lord God, to listen for your voice every day. Holy Spirit, examine our hearts and lives. We want to be with you. We want to, we want to be connected with you, not, not, not have anything in the way of relationship with you. Examine us, oh God, I pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Go ahead and stand with me. I know we went longer than normal. Thanks for sticking with me. <laughs> Just as you go through this, this life, as you go through walking this, this death body of yours, <laughs> and the older you get, the more you feel the death body, right? Just remember, God is with you wherever you are, and he's ready to, to bring what you need to draw you to him. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you today, and we pray that as we get ready to go out of this place, Lord God, may our hearts and our minds be drawn to you. Walk with us, Lord God. We might bring you glory. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this morning. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, I haunt you, baby.